the Bible says that we've been called out of the darkness into God's wonderful light. Well, my guest today will tell you that he lived a dark lifestyle for a very long time. And it wasn't until his third time in prison that he finally found, I love this, he found freedom behind bars. All the way from the UK, here to share his amazing journey of faith and salvation is John Lawson. Hey, Joe. Thank you so be much for being here in Canada. I appreciate yeah. it so much. You know, I, I have to tell you, uh, re reading this book, it was like, I had to keep reminding myself, hang on a second, this isn't a novel. Yeah. This is real. This guy, John, isn't a character that some Hollywood director made up. You would live this life. Mm -hmm. And uh, in research and prep for this interview, I was watching um, a presentation you gave down in Cape Town, South Africa, and you started off in a very unusual way. Usually I come to a church and I say, hey, I'm so happy to be here. I'm so excited to tell you my story. And you said, I, I, I hate doing this. I, I, I don't like telling my story. Tell, tell me why you say that. I think, you know, we have a, an expression in, in England, I'm sure you have it here, that you don't wash your dirty laundry in public. Right. And um, the other thing is, when, when we're sharing memories, um, I don't know about you, but when I'm sharing memories of childhood, I, I picture those things. They're, in my mind, they're at the forefront. And so I'm invited to come and share some horrible things because, yeah, to my shame, I've been a horrible, violent animal. And now I've got to talk about it in front of people that I don't know and mm. just expose my innermost horrible things and I have to remember those things and for me I find it painful I, I hate doing it I don't like doing it at all but I will continue to do it so we can get question, to the good why, part why do you do it? so we can get to the gospel and, and, and try and attempt to show people the contrast between the dark and the light and what Christ has really really done for me mm, awesome. um, but I, sometimes I think I hear people and they almost glorify it comes across glorifying their past. Um, I'm ashamed of it, mm. I really am. Yeah, well, I'm so thankful for your bravery to be able to come out and talk about all these things that you did. And, you know, I was trying to figure out your, your accent because you grew up in so many different parts of the world. You were born, was it in Scotland, yeah. then you lived in South Africa, and then you spent the majority of your life in the UK. Yeah. How did that all kind of happen? Well, when I was three, we emigrated to South Africa. We lived in from Scotland. Uh, from Scotland. We lived in a, a very poor area called Mary Hill. And um, it was a new, new opportunity. My dad had docked in Durban when he was in the Merchant Navy, liked it. And so he took me and my mum when I was three for this new life in South Africa. I grew up there. It was amazing with the, the sea and the sand and, mm. and the sun. Uh, I had a really good life as a child. Mum and dad seemed to be happy. My dad was a policeman. Uh, my little brother was born and things seemed to be going really, really well. Mm. But then when I was 10, my mum had to return to the UK really quickly because my grandfather had terminal cancer. Right. And they said to my mum, you have to come home now. So she came back to the UK with my little brother and I stayed in South Africa with my dad. With dad. And the plan was that uh, we would be reunited either by moving to the UK or my mum coming back to South Africa. Mm -hmm. But my dad unfortunately had other plans and he was having an affair with a woman at work. Mm -hmm. And he locked me in our flat one day when I was 10. He said to me, you know, be a brave boy. You're 10 now, you're a man. Wow. If it gets dark, put yourself to bed. And off he went and he left and he never came back. Just left you in this? He just locked me in and left and he went off with this woman. And maybe he would have come back, but on the fourth day, some friends who I'm still in yeah, touch with today, were... For three days, three nights, on three days, own, three nights, at ten years old, hadn't eaten for a few days, and wow. was really upset and crying. But some friends phoned the flat, and I don't remember this, but they say I answered in a bit of a distressed state. I do remember the door being broken open, and they helped me to stay with them, and uh, returned to the UK, where my grandparents, both my granddad and grandma, died quite quickly, mm. and my mum obviously had the news that my father didn't want us back. So we were moved to a housing estate on the outskirts of Glasgow, which was the, known as the roughest housing estate in Europe at the time. Yeah. That was a big contrast for me, because mm. in South Africa, you're brought up with respect and manners for your elders. And I was put into an environment where I saw other kids my age sniffing glue, taking drugs, carrying blades and being mm. prepared to use them. That was my first encounter with violence. And wow. violence in that community was a means to get respect. You earn respect right. with violence. Right. And I discovered I had an ability to take a punch, because I took quite a few punches, and an ability to fight. And I got into martial arts, and mm. um, I, I had a bit of a, 
a rough start to my, my life back in my own country where I felt like a foreigner. Then a few years later, we moved down to Liverpool and the whole ball game started again, but I was a bit more mm. wise this time. So I grew up through school, really getting into trouble. I'm sorry to tell you, I, I broke into factories and stole mm -hmm. things and I didn't have that father figure, you know? Yeah, now tell me about that because in the book you write about how you kind of, you lost respect for him, but also a disdain for the police began mm. at a young age. Why did that happen? I, I, I really hated the police because back there in, in, in that rough housing estate, the, I saw a lot of um, women getting beaten by drunken husbands mm. and the police would turn up and the woman would be there with a broken nose or a black eye and the police would just wash their hands with it and say, it's a domestic. Back in the day, if it was between husband and wife within a marriage, the police very, very rarely intervened. And so I just want, I wanted justice. I wanted something to be done. Mm. And I think maybe I watched too many episodes of the A-Team <laughs> as well, you know, like you've got to take action. Um, and that was me. I had just hated the police. So you felt they weren't carrying out justice and so you were wanting to do that in your I own way. I wanted justice. And there were a few times growing up where I had to intervene and help neighbours who were beaten by hu husbands and mm. fighting grown men at the age of 14. Um, to, I, I, just, I just didn't like the police and that was just my crazy mentality. Okay. And so by the time I left school, I was only good at fighting mm. and playing rugby. I wasn't good enough to be a pro. So yeah. uh, that's when really my life of crime would then take a, another level. Yeah, and it, and it escalated. It wasn't like you were this little kid and all of a sudden you got into this crazy lifestyle. Mm. Reading through the book, it, it just you see it grow and get deeper, deeper and heavier, and you got involved with, uh, was it the, the Maltese? The Maltese Mafia. Ma Mafia. Yeah, they would run most of Soho. Soho in London is the red light district. Oh, okay. My uncles were working for them, running peep shows and, and brothels and, and all sorts of strip bars. And I began to work for them because it's, I just wanted money, Joe, you know? Mm. I got married at a young age and divorced. Divorced, yeah. Became a single parent at a young age. Wow. I, I joined a motorcycle gang called the Nomads, looking for brotherhood uh, with the big, the big motorcycle and riding around in a gang and getting horrible tattoos on my arms. And my life was definitely spiraling and the escalation was increasing in terms of violence. I began to work as a bouncer. I worked in some of the roughest nightclubs in Manchester in um, Burnley and mm. Blackburn, across the northwest of England. I worked with a team of special forces soldiers, ex-special forces soldiers, and we would be sent to nightclubs where they had lost control. Mm. They put us in there to regain control, so the level of violence increased in my life. Is that where you're wearing like the special the body armor yeah. protection to go in? We would wear shin pads and what they call cricket boxes, and uh, we would wear um, stab-proof vests and, and, and carry truncheons, and, and knuckle dusters, and we were very, very violent to, to stamp out uh, more violence or drug mm. dealers. So we kind of had this form of that we were, we were the sheriffs, you know, and we weren't going to take any nonsense. But that would lead me then into uh, training to become a bodyguard. I worked for a short time with people like the Rolling Stones, yeah, yeah. ACDC, REM, Neil Diamond, these kind of people, movie premieres, and I thought I was a big, you know, a big important man at that point. Wow. Um, but behind the scenes, I was remarried again and had two kids and behind the scenes I was now working for gangsters because in those circles, mm. in those rock and roll circles, there's a lot of money and those people really, the guys at the top, they don't like to get their hands dirty so they would employ me and my men. Mm. Uh, we would be the ones to come and find you if you were stupid enough to have stolen money from them. So I had this dual personality going on. On right. one side I believed I was a good man. I loved my wife and kids and I didn't drink or do drugs. I didn't beat her up or, mm. you know, and on, on the other side, I was going out and putting a balaclava on and kidnapping men now and holding them hostage and, and, and beating them in horrible ways. And I really, um, I, yeah, I, I feel like I've got blood on my hands, you know? Yeah, it gets me. You know, I, I'm hearing you say these things and now I'm hearing the voice. Mm. I had a voice in my head because I watched you on YouTube, but now I'm trying to put the man that I see in front of me and connecting him to the man I read about in the book. Mm. And it's so hard to reconcile. It's unbelievable the change that has come in your life. And we only have a few minutes left, believe it or not, you know. Mm. And here you are, you're in prison for the third time. And tell me about your Nigerian friend. It was amazing, serving five years in prison. I met this Nigerian guy who was a Christian and that was the one thing I didn't like about him. <laughs> but he insisted for four months that I come to the Bible study. And one day I changed my mind because he shared with me something really important. That's right. 
he said that the pastor brings in cake and coffee and biscuits. And I thought, wow. In prison, that's not uh, Yeah. I said, why didn't you share that with me before? <laughs> I went along to this Bible study with the intention of stealing as much coffee as I could. But I was impacted by 12 other prisoners there who sat back in their chairs and began to sing. And, and I remember looking at the words of the song sheet. It was called, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. And I just felt in that moment I was going to cry. And I cried. I hid my face behind the paper. I didn't want them to see me crying. The next day... Um, that guy, Tony, his name was. He lives in uh, Vancouver now. Oh, wow. We're still in touch. He wow. gave me a Bible. I reluctantly took it. And that night, I opened the Bible and I read from the book of Ezekiel. Now, you did something that we normally don't encourage. You just opened up the Bible and went, here. I just, I didn't know where to begin. Yeah. And I opened up kind of almost in the middle. My Bible f almost fell open at the middle in Ezekiel. And I read something, which is where I take the title, the title. Of, of the book, If That's a Wicked right. Man. Um, I read, but if a wicked man, if a wicked man turns away from all the wickedness that he has committed, wow. and if he does what is just and right, he can save his life. And a little bit further down, um, God says that uh, he can give you a new heart and a new spirit if you repent. And um, I wanted a new heart and a new spirit. I didn't yeah. know about Jesus. I did, at that point, I didn't want Jesus. I wanted a new heart and a new spirit, mm. Joe. Mm. But I found out the only way is through, through Christ. And that prison chaplain, he's, he shared the gospel with me in such a simple way. As a criminal, he spoke to me about the law. He used okay. the law to, to capture me there. Very smart. He said, yeah. you were in court, you stood before a judge. The judge found you guilty, you went to prison. One day you're going to stand before God on judgment day. Will you be guilty or innocent, John? Mm. How many lies have you told in your life? And he took me through a few of the wow. Ten Commandments. So applicable. Yeah. And I said, I'm guilty. He said, well, heaven or hell. It's as simple as that. Mm. I said, I think I'm headed to hell. He asked me, does that not concern you? And then he said to me, you know, if a rich man came and paid your fine in court, the judge could set you free. Well, when Jesus Christ went to that cross, he paid your fine. And after three days, it's like he wrote a check for your life. And after three days, the check cleared. <laughs> like and a that. legal transaction takes place in heaven. God can legally dismiss the case against you because Jesus paid your fine. If only you're willing to put your faith and trust in him. Well, I'll tell you, Joe, I did that in that prison. Wow. And he gave me a new heart and new spirit. I love that because you say you found freedom behind bars and now God is taking you all over the world. And I love when you said you're sitting on a plane and somebody says, hey, why are you going to Canada? Why are you going to Africa? What's your answer to them? You say, I'm going. Well, <laughs> uh, I say, well, I'm going to some of the toughest prisons on the planet. I'm a former violent criminal uh, that was involved. And besides, you're on a plane for seven hours. They can't go anywhere. <laughs> They're stuck, you know. Um, I've got them for seven hours, so I'm, I'm going to gently share the gospel with them. Yeah. But I love uh, sharing the gospel on airplanes. It's one of the best places to do it because you're trapped. That's right. You know? um, but yeah, today I've been over by God's grace. I'm married now to Carolyn and we have a, I have a home and family and things that I just, I didn't deserve, you know, by his grace and glory. I've traveled to about 25 countries. I speak in some of the toughest prisons on this planet and it's a privilege and honor to go in there and share with the guys. Uh, and I also uh, train and equip Christians in evangelism because, you know, I discovered 98% percent of Christians in the West don't share their faith. Mm. That really bothers me. It's a bad step. And so I want to change that. And I'm working alongside churches with an incredible training program to equip Christians to get out there and share their faith as well. You know, we, in, in our last minute together, if somebody is watching this interview today and they happen to be, just, you know, flipping through the channels and they hear this guy with this incredible backstory, what would you say to a person who's maybe not to the same degree of where you were, but they're lost and they're away from God and they're angry and they're full of hate and violence. What would you say to that person who's watching today? I would just say that I was amongst the most violent of people. I had no heart. I was willing to murder, as you'll read in the book. I was so lost, but I found God. I found that God is real. I looked at this world and I saw the mess it's in. I saw the mess we're in. And I, I knew in that moment that there was a creator. Mm. I saw it in design. I looked at a building, I knew there was an architect. Mm. I, I look at a painting, I know there was a painter. And in that moment in my cell, I realized there was a God. And I tell you, I don't know who you are or what you've done, but I know that if God can forgive a violent animal like me, then he can forgive you. Mm. And all you have to do is in faith, trust that he's there, search for him, repent, and surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And I promise you, his word says he give you a new heart and new spirit. I'm living proof that that happens. And I'm so glad that you said you can't reconcile the man in the book to the right. man today, because my wife said the very same thing. 
She said, I can't imagine that violent man yeah. as my husband. And for me, that's the greatest testimony. Amen. Yeah. Well, you know, very well said. And I know that some of you are watching this interview right now and you're interested in his story. Well, you can hear and read about it in his book called If a Wicked Man. It's, it's an incredible journey of how God can take somebody who's so far away from him and in one moment he turned towards God and God was there to receive him and he's there to receive you as well. And we want to encourage you to call the prayer lines Maybe what he said just spoke to you and you're like, oh, I'm so far away from God. I feel like he can't forgive me. You know what? He can forgive you and he wants to forgive you. So if you call right now, I guarantee there will be somebody on the other end of that line who will pray with you and make an introduction that will change your eternity.